Good evening, church family. We are definitely uh, encouraged by your attendance here tonight. We pray that you've had a blessed day. I know that we are uh, excited about another opportunity to assemble together as church family and to be able to worship God together to give him the praise that, that he is due. One point that I was asked to clarify from this morning in regards to Vacation Bible School registration, today is the last day that you can register and get a t-shirt. If, but you can still register all the way up through uh, the beginning of, of Vacation Bible School. So some have felt like, well, I don't know, what, you know what's, what do I do if I don't know exactly sure, you know, if they're coming or not. Still register them, but we're ordering t-shirts first thing in the morning. And so because of that, I just wanted to try to clarify and encourage you to go ahead and register tonight. But if it's after tonight, please go ahead and do so. But again, can't promise you the uh, super flashy red and white t-shirt that we've got designed for our Vacation Bible School this year. So again, we're glad that you're here. We look forward to worshiping God together. If you would, please be standing as we uh, will begin our worship together. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. We praise Yeah. 
Would you bow with me? Loving Father, we love you so much because you first loved us. We're so grateful for the opportunity of prayer, and we ask that you look down upon each of us and grant us mercy and forgiveness, for we are mortals and we do make mistakes. Forgive us, we pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this congregation and the great work that is done here. We're so concerned about souls that are lost and finding them and helping them to find the way, the truth, and the life. Father, we make every effort to maintain the spirit of unity in this congregation, to keep it in the bond of peace. We always need to feel your peace and your comfort. For those of our number, and there are many, that are troubled and suffering, hurting for all kinds of reasons, bless them, Father, and help them as only you can. We're concerned about them. We love them, and we want them to be in good health and in good spirits. Be with us through this worship period tonight, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, had it not been This is my story, this is my 
reading tonight comes from Psalms 46, verses 10 and 11. Psalms 46, starting in verse 10, I'll be reading for the New King James Version. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in, all, in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Appreciate John reading there from Psalm 46. We will get to that text here in a little while. I'm going to ask you would do go ahead and open to the book of Habakkuk. Now you may say, where is that at? Well, in my Bible, if you find Matthew chapter 1, go back to the left 10 pages, and you should be at least close. It's about as much help as I can give you finding the book of Habakkuk. I want to say to you tonight that I've been deeply struggling over the past three to four weeks. I find myself restless at night, I find myself dealing with feelings and thoughts and emotions that, frankly, I don't want to deal with. I've been wrestling and, and just trying to figure out what can I do to help calm my spirit. You see, as I begin to read and to look at what's going on in the world around me, causes unrest. You can't go very far by turning on social media, the news, or reading something and reading all about the pain that people are going through. Learning about the corruption so many in, are involved in. Seeing and reading about the sinful living and lifestyle that are being paraded as good. The town in which I live there in, in Norman, Oklahoma, an article came out recently talking about how they have gone so far to the left that a lot of their donors are just jumping out as quickly as they can because, again, they've gone way, way too far. You've been reading and, and learning about the social unrest that a lot of people are going through. You begin reading another article about how, quote, basic Bible knowledge in the UK is at an all-time low, if you will. The people just don't know Bible basics. They don't know the difference between the Word of God and a quote from a Disney movie. And as I read about this stuff, I have to tell you that it just weighs on me. 
it, it tugs at my heart, and I'm trying to figure out, just to be transparent with you, I'm trying to figure out, are we winning anything? As we think about striving to let our light shine and to be the salt of the earth and to, to just make a positive influence on the lives of others, are we truly winning it all? Everywhere we're we turn, we're surrounded by people who have no regard for God. And it seems as time as though we're losing ground in our battle for the hearts and the minds of people. And so moments when we look around and notice wicked people are even prospering. That's the one that can really get to us. And it feels like we live in a time in which, in our span of life, that we're living in the most morally bankrupt time in our lives. And so I'm uneasy. I'm, 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 I'm struggling as a Christian. Maybe you can relate to what I'm saying. Maybe you've dealt with similar thoughts and emotions. You're trying to figure out, you know, what do we do? What, you know, where, where is God? Where is... What, what, what's happening? How can things be as bad as they are? And, and then think about trying to raise our families, our children and our grandchildren in this time and trying to say, how do we help them navigate these turbulent waters in which we find ourselves? And as I was spending some time reflecting, I began to realize and I was reminded of the presence of wickedness in our world is not a new occurrence. If you find, look with me in Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 7, it says, And the Lord saw the wickedness of man and was great on the earth, and every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him, being God, to his heart. Knowing God, too, was grieved as he looked down upon the wickedness of man, upon that creation. The, the one thing that he designed to have relationship with. You can fast forward to Genesis chapter 19, 4 through 7. It says, but before we lay down, the men of the city, talking about Abraham and Lot, that, that scenario there. The men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. And that wasn't about just sitting down over a cup of coffee and trying to figure out what was going on and catch up with each other's lives. That's not what the word means there. And you begin to see what was going on, and you, and you read about Lot saying, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. The word's there intentionally. We can read Judges chapter 2 and verse 19 says, but whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. All throughout time, we can read about the wickedness of man. We could go forward to the, uh, to the New Testament, and, and if we wanted to take the time, we could look at what was happening in the church of Corinth. We could examine what was going on in the church of Ephesus. We could, could see what was going on there in Rome. And so, as we think about this, what is the solution to wickedness? And so tonight... I want to focus in on three passages. The first one is in Habakkuk chapter 1, and then we'll look a little bit at chapter 2. We're going to look at Romans chapter 1, and then as John read, Psalm chapter 46. And so I want to look at this lesson in two parts. I want to look at the problem, and then we're going to look at the solution that we glean from the Word of God. So you'll, if you'll look with me in Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk chapter 1, and we're going to read the first four verses of Habakkuk. It says, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Habakkuk says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. We begin to find out there in the very first verse about Habakkuk and his role. He reveals to us that he's a prophet. He's a, a special messenger from God, if you will, responsible for delivering God's were to the people. We know that Habakkuk looked around at the world in which he lived and he was 
utterly, totally, and completely disgusted with what he saw. And so you can hear the, the pain in his voice. You can see and feel the, the dismay, the, the just true, honest pleading to God, trying to figure out what is going on. You can hear the desperation in his voice. Notice some of the phrasing of what's going on. He talks about the iniquity. Iniquity there, another word for that is sinfulness. The, to sin means to, to miss the mark. If you literally translate it from the original language, it literally means to zigzag, is what iniquity means. And so it's like bouncing from left to right, bouncing from things possibly that are good or, or, uh, or wrong, but at the same time, in this case, going from bad to worse, if you will. But it's this idea of a, of a zigzag. You hear about him talking about wickedness and destruction and violence and strife and contention. And so I ask you tonight, does this sound familiar to us today? To hear about these words and to feel the emotions that Habakkuk felt as he wrote this letter and as he was having this conversation and sharing with us then and then ultimately for us today. You begin to find out that the iniquity, the wickedness, destruction, violence, strife, and contention ultimately were symptoms, if you will, of a bigger issue. Look again at verse 4. He says, look around the nations because, as he goes on, he says that the law was being paralyzed. The law is being paralyzed. In other words, the law was being ignored. To, par to uh, uh, state it in today's terms, they were completely ignoring the word of God. They didn't want anything to do with it. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want it read. They wanted nothing to do with it. Just like we read in Judges 21, 25, it says, When everyone does what is right in their own eyes, that sin or destruction will be the end product. But what I want you to do is now is go with me to Romans chapter 1. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Don't lose your ribbon or your marker there in Habakkuk. We're going to come back in just a little bit. But go with me to Romans chapter 1. We're probably more familiar with what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, but I want you to hear the uh, similarities of what was going on in Habakkuk's time and now what is going on in the time of Paul. Start with me in Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, and to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever in all men. For this reason, God gave them up to the dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those who are contrary to nature, and their men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with others and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithful, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. It was interesting to me as I was going through this funk, if I can say, just going through this difficulty of trying to wrap my mind around what's going on, that even though I believe Paul is a lot more descriptive, to just see that Paul could relate with what Habakkuk was talking about, to see what was happening here. We find out, as Paul lays it out, that God made himself known 
to his creation. God made himself known. We can look back to the old law and see that God at one time spoke directly to his creation, where he spoke to Adam and Abraham and Noah and Moses and the like. Then he went and he spoke through the prophets, allowed them to be messengers. We know that, that uh, the angels were involved in declaring and decreeing special messages that need to be known from God directly to man himself. And so we read about that, but we know today that God speaks to us through a son, that of Jesus Christ. But not only did he make himself known to man, but we also know that God made himself known through creation, is what Paul says. We begin to see where his invisible attributes have been clearly seen, where his eternal power has been clearly seen, his divine nature has been clearly seen. I know for a lot of you, it's been a long time since you sat in a classroom, a science classroom, that is, studying a science book. But I guarantee we can remember that when you spend any time at all and you begin to just think about just the human body and to think about all the intricacies and how everything has to be perfect and in balance, and if it's out of whack, Kevin translation, then we have a lot of problems. You can't tell me that that happened through some explosion. You can't tell me that happened by circumstance. But no, we understand that there was an intelligent designer, an all-powerful, all-creator, who is the one who formed us. And so the question you could be posed from this passage is, what was the response to God's revelation? He let himself be known to his people and through his creation, but how did they respond? You begin to find out, and it's the acrostic hate I never noticed this until I was studying it recently, but hate. Number one, they didn't honor God, H. Two, they didn't acknowledge God, there's your A. Three, they didn't thank God, there's your T. And then number four, your E, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's how they, once they began to, to understand and to hear that there was a God, that's how they responded. They didn't want anything to do with him. They didn't honor him. They didn't acknowledge him. They didn't thank him. And they exchanged what was truth that is from God and of God, ultimately for that, for a lie. That's why, church, it's so important that we spend time in the Word of God. And more than that, we spend time with God. And being able to allow Him to see that we want to honor Him through our words and our deeds and our life, that we want to acknowledge Him by having the name of Jesus constantly upon our lips. We want Him to know that, that we love Him and appreciate Him. We want to thank Him we want to be like that one leper, not the nine of those ten lepers that were all healed. We want to be like the one that comes back to Jesus and says, Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for sticking with me, even though I continually miss the mark. And then if we want to know where truth is found, it is found only in Jesus Christ and him crucified. So now that I've depressed you by looking at the problem now I want to try to walk us through the solution. We'll begin to find, go back with me to the book of Habakkuk, and look with me in chapter 2. Chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, I will take my stand at your watch post and, my station, and station myself on the tower, and look out to see what he will say to me, and I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it, for it will surely come, it will not delay. The first thing I want us to think about as far as a solution, first of three, is number one, notice that he said, write the vision and make it plain for people to understand. Well, that's wordy. If you're taking notes, clearly proclaim the word of God. Clearly proclaim the word of God. Now, you may be sitting there tonight in this pew and say, well, Kevin, that's what, you, that's what you're doing, and that's what Keith does, and that's what Sam does, and Brady does, and, and, you, and you have your list. No, this is about us. This isn't about you, but it's about an internal me. 
It's about each and every one of us through the ways that we live our lives, through the way that we speak, through the things that we share of understanding that the only way that this world will get better is if we constantly sow the seed to allow God to water and therefore for the increase to come through God himself. But if I can be completely transparent once again, I feel that the church, we've missed the mark. We become comfortable coming in and sitting in our pews and saying, yep, had another good week. Instead of realizing that we come here to get charged up, to regroup, to get our mindset, to get our spirit settled so that we understand our mission, our purpose, so that when we get up Monday morning, that then we can go out and share the message with people that need to hear it. We can come in these buildings, in these walls, and we can talk about evangelism all day. But until we take ownership of it, until we understand that the only way things are going to get better is if it starts with me, to understand the person whose reflection I see in the mirror, that that is who's got to do their part. Now, I want to be clear. Is it up to us to, quote, save people? No. But it is our job and our role to sow the seed. And so if we begin to take ownership of that, then some great things will come forth. We see that Paul understood this truth about clearly proclaiming the word of God. In Romans 1.16, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God of salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I continually pray that I can get to the point where I can say this. Where I get so excited about preaching and teaching and sharing Jesus that it literally excites me in my core. Because the truth of the matter is, it's scary. It's scary to stand before a group of people. It's scary because you're vulnerable and people are sitting there passing judgments on you trying to figure out, well, did he do a good job? Did he keep me awake? And what time is lunch, right? And we have all these things going on. It's scary, but I pray that we is a family can get to the point where we're so eager to preach the gospel through boldness and through love that we can sit back and see what God has done with it. Paul charged Timothy to preach the word in 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 and 2, and he said, I want you to do it in season and out of season. What that means is I've covered all the bases. There, there's no downtime. It's to be done as often as we have opportunity you see, when the world is turning aside to miss, we need to preach the word of God. When the world is, is, is lost and doesn't understand what's right and what's moral and what's holy and what's righteous, we need to preach and teach the word of God. When the world, even the religious world, is wanting to have their ears tickled, as the scriptures say, and only hear things that are fluffy and cool with religion, as Buster Side said years ago, I'll never forget that, just all fluff and stuff but no substance, We've got to teach and preach the word of God. Second thing, look with back me in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Verse 4 of Habakkuk 2, it says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But notice this, but the righteous shall live by his faith. We've got, number two, to live by faith. We've got to understand that difficult times are going to come, but even though I may not understand what's going on, even though my faith may want to waver, be stronger at times than others, to understand that as a child of God that I'm living by faith, that I'm understanding that God is going to take all of this mess and it's his own divine way through his own divine plan is still going to redeem those who turn to him. Paul went on and said in Romans 1.17, he says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, notice this, the righteous shall live by faith. I had never made the correlation that Paul was quoting Habakkuk chapter 2 until, in verse 4 until today. He understood. I can't help but wonder because of this. I can't help but wonder, is it possible that Paul was reading Habakkuk? And as he was wrestling with the world that was going on around him, if his mind didn't drift back there, and to think, huh, I now have a deeper understanding of what Habakkuk was writing about because I find myself living in that same type of atmosphere. 
Hebrews 10, excuse me, 11 and verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events, is yet unseen, in reverent fear, he constructed an ark for saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, notice, that comes by faith. When I get to heaven and I get to meet Noah, I want to feel his hands. You ever thought about the fact that if you are building something for a hundred years, you know that dude had to have man hands, right? You know those, those men that work with their hands? Don't touch my hands. But those men that work with their hands, you know how they're calloused and they're rough. They're strong. You think about all the saws and the hammers and the lifting. Imagine just the hands that that guy had to have. I digress. But if you think about what's going on here, you begin to see that for a hundred years, he allowed his faith in the spite of chaos, in the spite of more than likely people coming up and continually mocking him and his family, but he stuck to the plan of God. And then number three, now go with me to Psalm 46 and verse 10 that, that John read for us. Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among every nation and all the earth. Here in a moment, we're going to sing the song. Most of us, you already knew what it said. You can find it on pillows. You can find it on your computer desktop graphics. You can find it on coffee mugs. Find it on t-shirts. It's probably one of the most, in my opinion, well-known and, and quoted scriptures that the earth knows and humanity knows about. But as I was comparing some of the different translations, I want to share two others. The first one is the contemporary English version. Listen to the, what this, this version says. It says, calm down and learn that I am God. Now, I can tell you right now, if I was writing a Kevin Langford translation, that's exactly what it would say about Psalm 46 and verse 10. Actually, mine would say simmer down. Okay, but calm down and know that I am God, for all nations on earth will honor me. The second one that I found interesting was the Wycliffe Bible. It says, give ye attention, and see ye that I am God. I shall be exalted among the heathen, and I shall be exalted over all the earth. As I begin to think about the different translations, but just to be still, or to give ye attention, or to calm down, that seems to take on a, a clear picture for me. To understand that when I find myself worked up or down, going through the various emotions, to understand that there's some things that I need to do and not to, as the Wycliffe Bible put it, to allow the heathen to get me worked up. The idea of being still. As I begin to think about that, I, truth be told, I don't know if I really grasp what that meant. I can remember being a child and my parents saying, be still, be still, right? And that means quit moving, right? Quit, quit wiggling around. But what it literally means, if you look back in the original language, is it literally means put your hands down. The imagery here and what I believe that is, is being conveyed is we find ourselves trying to fix everything. We, we find ourselves in, in conflict with things that are around us, and our guard is up, our hands are up. But what God is saying, he says, look, I know this stuff's going on, if I may paraphrase. I know this is occurring, but what I want you to do is to declare the word of God. I want you to be uh, faithful and righteous in your living, but when it comes to the things that are not under your control or that you can control, just put your hands down. I want you to relax. I don't want you to allow this to completely consume you put them down but the key to that verse is not put your hands down that's not where the the period is on that sentence but it goes on and says and know what i'm god and so as i was working through this in my mind it came to realize are there times in my life in which i'm trying to become my own god i'm trying to be completely in control of my own circumstances. 
I'm trying to change everyone and everything around me to fit my narrative, which I pray is his narrative. What he's saying is, look, put your hands down, but know that I'm God. The word know there is very interesting. It's a deeper level of knowing coupled with quietness and trust. And the way it's written is an active command, not a passive emotion. It is something that we are continually doing. We are wanting to know. The Hebrew word there is in our English is, looks like yada, Y-A-D-A. That's not how it's pronounced in Hebrew, but that's what it looks like. And it literally means to have an intimate knowledge of what is already known or revealed. And so whenever the psalmist is saying, or God is responding to the psalmist saying, be still and know that I am God, it's about knowing God so personally and intimately that when all the storms are around us, we can truly relax with hands and palms open, knowing that God loves us and he cares for us. Sin surrounds us. All around us is wickedness, all around us is violence, all around us is chaos. But I'm refreshed to know that this happened in the time of Habakkuk, and this happened in the time of Paul, and that we can glean insight from these men and the storms that they went through, and to see that it is the same God that ministered and served them back then is still the same God that we serve today. And so our action statement is very clear. Trust him. Trust him. Put our hope and our faith in him. And together as we press forward with the mission that we've been called to do, by being willing to clearly teach and to share the word of God, to live faithfully, and then to just be still and know that he is God. May our spirits be refreshed. May our minds be at ease, and may he be glorified in all that we do, say, in all that we are. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation for any reason, we ask that you come forward now as we stand and as we sing. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I have one that came forward tonight and I would like to read his statement dear church family these past six or seven weeks have been the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life I ask that you continue to pray for me I know that I need to be a better Christian a better Christian leader of my family these past few weeks my anxiety and knowing that I need to do better I've been short with the ones I love and the ones that love me the most, my wife and kids. Thank you so much for your show of love, your calls, support, visitors, cards, foods, etc., that you've extended to myself and family. Surgeries in the five surgeries in the last six weeks have worn me out. Please keep us in your prayers with Christian love. Paul McMahon. Thank you, Paul. I guess we could all say that. We need to be, as men, better Christian leaders of our family. We have several others that are 
on our prayer list. Uh, James Bowling, as you know, had foot surgery. Jim Fisher had a scope procedure this morning on his knee, and he is doing well. Uh, we will pray for his continued recovery. Chuck McDaniels is having an MRI on Monday tomorrow with his neurologist to check the blood vessels in his head and neck, and we're praying for good results there. And Travis Nams is going to have an outpatient procedure on his back on Friday, May 26th at Medical City, Carrollton. We pray for him. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we're so thankful that we can come to you in prayer and ask you for those things that we are in need of. Your love, your grace and mercy is shown all around us. We ask you now to be with all of those that we've mentioned on our sick list, with Paul McBann, we pray strength and blessings and care upon him. With Chuck McDaniel, we pray for him as he has the procedure. With David Pippin, with Jim Fisher, and with Travis Nelms. We ask you, Father, to continue to be with each of them. You've allowed mankind, Father, to make many advances in healthcare and medicine, but we know and fully realize that you are the great physician. We ask you to be with us now, be with those doctors and nurses and caregivers. Forgive us of our sin, Father, and continue to bless us with those things we stand in need of. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you weren't able to take the Lord's Supper, you can uh, make your way out as we sing this last song. Let's stand, please. Well, this will be letter prayer. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn covered crown makes me whole, saves my soul, washes wider than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on. Father God, our hearts are open to you now as we approach your throne. We're so thankful that we can be here, Father, that we have access to you anytime, that you're there, that you hear us, and that you're working on our behalf every day. 
We're thankful for Jesus and for the Spirit, Lord, and for what they do for us. And we pray that we'll make room in our hearts this week for your Spirit to work. We ask that you'll be with all those who were mentioned tonight and those who weren't mentioned, Lord, those who are on our hearts. We pray that you will be with them. And in these uh, situations, Father, we, we pray that you'll be at work. And Father, as, as Kevin mentioned tonight, we pray that we will have uh, the courage and the awareness to act when we can act. Father, we pray that we will remember that we're part of our body. We pray you'll help us to remember that we're here for each other. Uh, and that, that means showing up. And that means caring, even when it may not be convenient. Father, we ask, too, that when things are beyond our grasp, or Father, when we're struggling, we'll help you or you'll help us to remember to just be still because you can do infinitely more than we could ever possibly know or think. And Father, we pray that that power will be at work in each of our lives this week. Thank you so much for this church home, for your servants that are here, for the way that you're working. Please keep us safe, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.